In this video I'm going to show the process I used to make a bar of mosaic pattern welded steel. The pieces you see here have already quite, had quite a bit of pattern welding work on them and I'm getting ready for the next stack and four-way weld. It's important when you're forge welding to have clean surfaces together. You don't want a lot of forge scale or, or flux remnants or other contaminants in there. It just makes the forge weld harder to get to stick and get clean. So what I'm doing here is grinding off the adjoining faces of each of those four bars. Um, I don't worry about grinding off the outside face, the face that's going to be in the forge fire anyway. Uh, that's not trying to stick to anything, and it's just going to get all scaled up again, so no sense in wasting the steel. You can see here as I go, i got to grind through the bark that's on the very outer layer, some of the crud and scale and decarburized stuff. But as I get into the good steel, you can see the quality of the sparks really goes up quite a bit. I'm trying to get the surfaces completely clean, but doing it manually like this, they're not going to be perfectly flat. For me, that seems to be okay. Usually I can deal with a little bit of small gaps. So now that the joining of faces of the blocks have been cleaned off, I can stick them together, tack weld them, and get them in the forge to do the forge welding. It's surprisingly easy to get the pattern mixed up when you're doing this. Uh, I don't show it very well in this video, but there's a pattern developing on the end grain of each of these bar. And the idea is to line those patterns up so that you develop the mosaic pattern that you're after. And it's surprising how often I have gone through this process and at this stage somehow or another got a bar twisted or turned around or upside down and then that creates a discontinuity in the mosaic pattern. The little white specks you see are actually white out marks I put on there to tell me which faces go uh, against which adjoining faces. Uh, I used white out because the sharpie I was using didn't show up very well on the steel. So. Here I'm getting ready to have them all uh, getting getting pretty well lined up. I'm going to move them into a vise, and then I'm going to tack weld uh, pretty lightly. Uh, this weld intrudes into the steel and creates a problem in your pattern that essentially just has to get ground out. So anywhere you do any MIG welding, you're, you're losing steel that you could use later on. The idea here is just to hold them together in the forge well enough to get the forge weld to stick. The really good old timers do this with uh, just wire. They don't miss with, uh, you see me, I have a bad habit of putting my ground clamp on the vise. Then I take parts out and forget I put the ground clamp on the bench and uh, one of these days I'll learn not to do that. Anyway, the old timers use wire to twist their billets together and then um, the wire doesn't tend to stick in the weld and falls off. I'm not good enough at forge welding to do that. I like the peace of mind of having the parts tack welded together. Here I'm just welding on a handle. It's a little piece of half-inch hot roll steel, uh, bevel the end, and then um, a pretty good, uh, I'll put a pretty good bead of weld around the end of this because you don't want the handle falling off in the middle of the process. Again though, all of this welding is just a contaminant that's going to have to get ground off later. Watching this video, I realized just how much of a fire hazard my workshop is. I'm going to have, I always, at any time I do hot work, I always scour pretty closely for about an hour afterwards to make sure that I don't have any hot embers anywhere, but uh, that's looking pretty scary. I'm going to have to clean my act up and do something better there. So here it's time to light the forge. This is a homemade forge made out of a 20 or a propane tank actually from a forklift. It's the same diameter as a 20 pounder, but it's a little bit longer. That allows me to get a couple more inches of zone, heat zone up to welding temperature, which is important to me when I'm working on billets like this because you want to get everything up to an even temperature and kind of squeeze it once. And you'll see that here in a minute. The uh, burners are two black, Bernie, uh, black Beauty burners that you can get online, and they seem to work really well, so I'm very happy with those. I sped this up a little bit so people don't have to watch all of this. Um, I should be playing yakety sacks or something, but my shed doubles as a storage shed and a forge, so I have to pull all this stuff out every time I use it. Um, I like using this shed though because it's about 300 feet away from anybody's house so if it burns down it's not the end of the world. I certainly don't want that to happen but I certainly don't want to burn my house down either. I don't have power out there so what I'm pulling out right now is the gasoline driven uh, hydraulic unit for my press. One of these days I'll move that engine outside so that it's uh, uh, I don't have to move it around like that but I get it out of the shed to reduce the noise and the exhaust fumes. 
Here you can see the forge burning. I can get up to about 2300 degrees at 20 psi with those two burners, so it works out pretty well. So here's the first welding pass. I'm just going to take a light kiss on this, clean off all the flux and crud, and then throw it back into the forge. I just want to get it started to weld and then get it back up to temperature. I don't want to push it too far. And then as I go along here, I'll get a little bit more and more aggressive. Uh, obviously, I've sped this up quite a bit. I'm sure everybody gets tired of watching me forge at real speed. I'm not real efficient at this. Uh, I'm not even going to claim I'm any good at this or any of an expert at this. Creating this video largely for posterity's sake and maybe to answer a few questions that I had along the way that, that uh, I'd figure out on my own. In a lot of ways, this process is pretty straightforward. All I'm really doing is taking those four bars that were kind of put together in a square cross-section and reducing them down in both directions so that I keep a relatively square cross-section. And eventually, I'll switch over to some squaring dies that will allow me to create a one-inch square bar. The key here is early on when the weld is young, not to push it too far. You don't want those uh, pieces of metal trying to slide past each other and shearing the weld. Give it time to truly diffuse and become a strong weld. And you can see as I go along here, I get pretty aggressive with it at one point and, and start reducing uh, the, the thickness down quite a bit. I'm still using flux on my welding. I've done some fluxless welds. Boy, that is really way to go. You don't have this mess that you're constantly scraping off the outside of the bar, brushing off the bar. I'm not refluxing at these points, it's just the, the flux makes a mess in the forge and every time I put it in there, there's even more, uh, more flux that's coming out on the part. So here I've slowed it down a little bit so you can see the beginning of the, the actual squaring off with squaring dies. Uh, there's still flux on the bar, it's still causing it to uh, stick to the dies. That'll slow down a little bit once the dies heat up. But I'll go through and square off the entire bar done, we'll clean that bar up, cut it up again, and do another welding pass. So I apologize for the not zoomed in view here. There's another set of welding passes I do a little later on where I've got the, uh, the camera a little closer to the forge so you can see what's actually going on with the metal. This is uh, getting pretty close to the end of this. What I'll do next is clean the bar up, uh, I'll soak it in vinegar overnight, that'll dissolve the forge scale, then I can grind the surfaces off, cut it up, restack it, and do this whole process. So it's the next day, this has been soaking in the vinegar overnight. That helps dissolve all the crud and scale off the outside of the bar. Uh, this is a little stainless steel brush I use, just guard hose and try to clean off all the loose crud. This is pretty important to do because that forge scale is very hard and it will just absolutely destroy your abrasive belts. You can take a brand new high dollar uh, ceramic belt and touch a bar that's covered in forge scale to it and just completely destroy that belt in about 30 seconds. So here I'm cleaning up the whole bar. Uh, this is before I cut it up into quadrants. Uh, pretty much the exact same thing I did before. I'll clean up uh, the bar well enough to make sure that there's no flaws in it and then I'll go clean up the good surfaces or the mating surfaces real well. Here you can see the markings I use to make sure I get the bars aligned correctly. And uh, here we go back to welding again. So here's another initial weld pass. Again, I'm just kind of kissing it there, not doing a whole lot. Just setting the weld. And this is obviously sped up again. And then we'll get a little bit more aggressive. I'll, I'll shrink it down a little bit more. Uh, I'm trying to keep everything pretty much square and cross section. Uh, especially with a mosaic. You don't want to get too lopsided or too out of kilter then that messes up the pattern you're trying to develop again. If you watch real close, you see my press isn't quite rigid enough. Uh, this is a home-built press, first time I'd ever built one, first time I'd ever designed one. Uh, came out pretty well. 
in a lack of a uh, moment of lack of wisdom I used UHMW guide blocks between the ram and those vertical uprights I was thinking hey those would be good wear surfaces and I can always tighten them up so I have zero clearance on the, well on the slides uh, that doesn't make any sense I've got to go back and redo those in steel that'll tighten that up a little bit I probably need to box in those angle angle uh, irons that uh, make up the vertical rails a little bit as well but but the presto is pretty good for for me and i'm still learning how to do all of this and you see i'm squishing the bar down a little bit uh, i'm still trying to keep it more or less square it's getting a little long there i've switched over to the squaring dies uh, everybody does these pretty much the same way it's a couple of pieces of angle iron that have uh, been welded to some blocks seems to work pretty well it's heavy wall, but it's still only about a quarter inch wall, but holds up well to the forces of the press. Close to the end of this welding patch, you can see the dies are coming almost completely together there. When they do, theoretically, I've got a perfectly square one-inch bar. Of course, this is forging. Nothing's that perfect. But when I'm done here, what I'll do is cut this bar up diagonally. So those are 45-degree diagonal cuts. Those pieces are a little over a half-inch thick, uh, measuring the, the thinnest dimension. And then I'll flip those 90 degrees and tack weld them together, again with a MIG welder, so that they all stay together as a, as a bar, throw that back into the forge, get it as hot as I can, and then forward weld this again. Here you can see the first passes at the bar, just kissing it again. You can see just a little bit of reduction. I actually kind of skipped to the end there because the center of the bar wasn't quite as hot as the ends and I didn't want to get too aggressive. Kind of closing it up there in the middle. Now I'm going to go back in the forge and make sure that I get it up to temperature and I'll start reducing it a little bit more. Um, just taking a couple of of light passes, making sure I keep everything warm. This is a pretty fragile weld. I'm always uh, kind of impressed when it works. I'll get this bar down to about 3 eighths thick, so that's a reduction from half inch, so I'm, I'm kind of increasing both width and length here doing this, just, just forging the square dies. And then you'll see me throw in some combination dies, and I'll start drawing it out lengthwise only. Uh, and I'll take it down to about a quarter of an inch. So here I am swapping the dies out. This is another one of those things I've gotten sloppy with. I really need to put keepers on these dies in this press. There's a chance that those things could pump, come flying out straight at the operator here. Always intended to do that, but once the press was up and kind of running, I got distracted with making steel and making knives, and uh, you know, need to get back to that. So here I've got a, actually a 3 8 inch block st as a stopper in there, hardly moving any steel at all. I just wanted to make sure I go through the bar once here and make sure there's no overly thick spots. This, these welds are still pretty fragile, and I don't want to get too aggressive with moving the steel at this point. You'll also see the bar starting to curve a little bit. Uh, means I've got some scale that's built up behind those dies and they're not pushed into the holders at the same point. So one's effectively in front of the other one a little bit. It's causing the bar to curve. I didn't realize it was curving that much when I was forging. Here in a little bit in this video, you'll see it goes kind of crazy and really just gets out of control. Um, not a big deal to straighten out, but you, you get kind of out of, out of control there and don't know where the other end of that bar is. It could be kind of a dangerous situation. Flatten the, die, the bar out just a little bit using the other side of the combo dies. And here we're going to go down into thickness a little bit again. You can see that flux. I haven't refluxed this bar since the initial setting of the weld. That flux is just invasive. It goes everywhere. It's all over the inside of the forge already. I've done this without flux. I really need to get back to it. It works amazingly well as long as you run your fire a little on the rich side. But uh, something about that flux is a little bit of a security blanket for me when I'm doing these 
more complicated welds. Uh, I've got so much time invested in the bar at this point, I hate to, hate to mess it up. So. Move the camera again so you can see a little bit more what's going on. The dies, because they're uneven, also create a little bit of a banana curve to the bar. Got to straighten that out, just a few lazy hammer blows there. You can see the undulations on the edge of the bar. Those are the spot welds from when I did uh, the flipping. People call it the fairy flip when you take those tiles and flip them over 90 degrees. I don't want to forge those welds down into the bar because I have to grind all of that off. And if I forge it down into the good steel, it's gonna, I'm going to lose even more of my pattern. So you'll see, I'll leave those crazy wonky undulations on the edges of the bar the whole time. Here you can see just how out of control that the, the misalignment of my dies is getting. Great, almost a 90 degree bend in that thing. Didn't realize it while I was forging. Easy enough to correct, but it's not a good idea to lose track of the end of your bar like that. So uh, The dies actually line up really well when the press is clean. I imagine what happened is I've got some scale built up that's keeping the dies from sliding all the way to the back side of the die holder. A few more lazy blows just to straighten things out. Speed things up again here just a little bit so you don't have to watch me forging forever. Out there I'm realizing how oh, my dies aren't seated right. Pretty much at the end of the forging, a little bit of straightening to do. Drawing the bar out like this creates kind of an undulated surface, so I've got to swap the combination dies back out for the flat dies again. It's amazing how hot those dies get at this point. If I didn't have those welding gloves on, I'd really be dancing around. Now I'm cleaning the flux off the bar, and again, I haven't refluxed this bar. This is just crud I'm picking up from the puddle of flux inside my forge. But I want to get a nice flat surface here with these flat dies, and I don't want to be pressing flux into the surface of the steel. So clean it off as best I can, smooth out the surface, Go back into the forge, heat up the other end of the bar, and do the same thing. You can see all the crap coming off the bar there. That's all flux. A little bit of scale, but mostly flux. This forge runs quite neutral to rich, actually. I have it uh, tweaked to run a little bit on the, on the reducing side so that I don't get a lot of scale buildup. Uh, so most of those sparks coming off there are flux decided I didn't have it as clean as I wanted, so I stuck it back in the fire to get a little bit more crud off of it before I forged it flat. Clean up the end of it. We should be just about done with the forging. So another overnight soak in vinegar and another session with a little stainless brush in the garden hose, cleaning off as much of the forge scale and crud as I can. I can't overstate how important this is. I've trashed a number of brand new ceramic belts just because I thought, ah, there's not much scale there. I can I can take it off the belt. And it's, it's amazing how fast it'll destroy a belt. Here I'm just cleaning up the surfaces. Um, this bar is destined to be a number of smaller knives. Probably quite a few folding knives, maybe some smaller uh, hunting knives. Um, I only went. F I'm only looking for a little over an inch in width here. Uh, right now, it's a little less than a quarter of an inch thick after cleanup. I'll do some more forging to get it to right shape. But that was a quick test dip in some ferric chloride, and here you can see the pattern. So thanks for coming along for the ride. This is actually my first attempt at truly editing a video, so I appreciate your time.